Dole Institute, Director Bill Lacey. Thank you very much, Kristen. Thanks to all of you for coming out on a beautiful fall day to, to talk about a topic that's very important to, uh, to our country and our future. Uh, let me begin by uh, telling you a little bit about the next two programs on our schedule tomorrow night. Uh, we will have a very interesting program run by our Student Advisory Board here at the Dole Institute of Politics that will feature three current or former KU students who are now abroad, and they will be talking about how other nations see our upcoming elections. Uh, we'll have one per couple of people in Europe and we think one gentleman in China, so it should be an interesting evening and hope you can join us for that. A week from tonight, we have author Sasha, Sasha I should say, Eisenberg, who is the author of a book called The Victory Lab, which uh, have any of you read or heard the uh, uh, read the book Moneyball or seen the money, the movie Moneyball? Any of you seen that? It's about baseball. It's about how statistics was applied to baseball and kind of changed the way the game was, uh, the game is played. And essentially what the book next week is about is uh, how political scientists have looked and studied campaigns and developed new techniques and how those techniques are being utilized in this fall's election. Uh, I would like to let everybody know that we have Dr. Goodman's book on sale uh, out in the lobby and that he will be signing copies immediately afterwards. Great Christmas presents, so make sure you pick up one, two, or three, however many Christmas presents that you need today. In terms of solving big problems, there's a tendency among many to turn to the federal government as a default position. This is not Dr. John C. Goodman's position on health care, and we're delighted to welcome him to the Dole Institute today. John C. Goodman is president and CEO of the National Center for Policy Analysis and author of the new book, the one he'll talk about today, Priceless, Curing the Healthcare Crisis. He is widely known as the father of health savings accounts. Dr. Goodman's health policy blog is one of the most popular health policy blogs, and it's the place where pro-free enterprise private sector solutions to healthcare problems are routinely vetted by experts from across the political spectrum. As a matter of fact, uh, John has been busy this afternoon putting the final touches on, it's an op-ed piece, right, that will appear in the Wall Street Journal tomorrow. Dr. Goodman concludes in Priceless, quote, liberated from the confinement of legal impediments and suffocating bureaucracies, doctors, patients, hospital personnel, and profit-seeking entrepreneurs are perfectly capable of solving our most serious health policy problems. All they need is the freedom to be able to do so. Please welcome Dr. John Goodman. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill, for that uh, very, very kind introduction. I thought our office was being a little bit generous when we suggested some of those remarks, but I enjoyed hearing every word of it. <laughs> now, if you Google the John Goodman Health Policy blog, you're going to discover two things. First, it is about the only health policy blog that approaches health care from an economic point of view. And all the principal bloggers at my site believe that the reason why we're having so many problems in healthcare is because people face distorted economic incentives. If the, when the incentives are perverse and when people act on those incentives, they do things that make costs higher, quality lower, and access more difficult than would otherwise have been the case. And we believe we're not going to solve any of these problems unless we get the economic incentives right. The second thing you're going to discover is that the John Goodman Health Policy Blog is the only health policy blog of any persuasion, whatever, that has a sense of humor. I don't know what it is about the field I'm in, but it tends to be dominated by a lot of sourpusses. And uh, we got a lot of people who not only don't have a sense of humor, but uh, they often don't even know when I'm joking. And that's gotten me in trouble uh, more than once, uh, including with Paul Krugman at the New York Times, who, who has no sense of humor at all. So we, uh, we created this, this yellow yield sign. It's for the humor challenge, and it's a, it's a satire alert is what it is. And so when you're at my blog and you see that sign, you'll know that not to take totally seriously what you're reading at that moment. But we believe if we can't make you smile at least once a day at the blog, we're just not doing our job. And we'll do things like we had a post the other day on how Obamacare is going to push you into HMOs and they're going to ration your care. And underneath that, we had Aretha Franklin from YouTube singing, Say a Little Prayer for You. <laughs> and then we had a, a post on end-of-life care, and underneath that, Bob Dylan singing, Knocking on Heaven's Door. And then we had um, this incredible exchange 
uh, at the blog between the doctors and the insurance guys. And they just went back and forth and back and forth. There were about 50 or 60 comments. And finally, this one doctor got so frustrated, he said, you know, you insurance guys are killing our patients. And I thought, well, you know, that, <laughs> that was so interesting. I decided to repost some of those comments. And underneath that one, I had Leslie Gore singing, you'd cry too if it happened to you. <laughs> Now, sometimes we're accused of uh, being insensitive and irreverent, and uh, I guess the worst thing we ever did happened about two years ago. This man walks into Parkland Hospital Emergency Room in Dallas, and he waits 19 hours, and he dies before he ever saw uh, a doctor. Maybe some of you read about it in the newspapers up here. Um, we thought that was a tragedy, and we thought uh, Dallas isn't the only place where this could happen. Uh, we've got a problem nationwide with emergency rooms. Uh, so we put a little post up on that, but underneath it we had Lionel Richie singing all night long. What was I thinking? All right. Uh, not good, not good. Uh, when I talk uh, to groups like this, I often have my cell phone with me. I notice uh, you were admonished to turn yours off, but you know, even in the middle of a speech you could have an emergency, right? That wasn't serious. <laughs> but this part is serious. Um, you know, there are more cell phones in the United States than there are people. And even the panhandler over on the street corner probably has a cell phone, but he probably also has difficulty getting access to health care. Uh, if something goes wrong with my cell phone, in Dallas, Texas, there are about a dozen shops that I can walk into without an appointment, get pretty quick service. It'll be high quality service, very reasonably priced. There are even shops that will send a repair person to my home and repair my iPhone in my condo. There's a national chain, it's called Eye Hospital, and the people who work for them are called Eye Doctors. Um, but on the other hand, if something happens to me, uh, did you know the average wait for a new patient to see a doctor in the United States is now three weeks? In Boston, where we're told that we have universal coverage, the wait is two months. And one out of every five individuals that walks into a hospital emergency room in the United States leaves without ever seeing a doctor because they just get tired of waiting. So my question to you is why is the market so kind to my iPhone and so mean to me and you? And I believe the answer is that this iPhone is bought and sold and repaired in a real market where people see real prices and where entrepreneurs know that if they can find some new solution to our problems, they can make millions of dollars. But over in healthcare, we have so suppressed the market for year after year, decade after decade, that no one ever sees a real price for anything. Uh, no patient, no doctor, no employee, no employer. We have completely bought in to the same idea that has dominated the healthcare systems of all the other developed countries. We, we argue back and forth that we're different from those other countries, but we're really not. Uh, we all, throughout the developed world, have accepted the idea that the way you make healthcare accessible is you make it free at the point of delivery. Uh, we have rejected the idea that people should pay for health care with cash. And so as a consequence, mainly in the United States, we pay for care the same way the Canadians do, the same way the British do. We pay it with time and not with money. Uh, if you ever notice when you call on a lawyer or an accountant or an engineer, an architect, that, that exterior area in the office is called a reception area, right? But in the doctor's office, it's what? It's a waiting room, right? Um, that's because we've decided we're going to make you wait for your health care. And that's what we're doing. And what we have forgotten is that when you completely suppress prices, you elevate all the importance of all the non-price barriers to care. And it turns out those non-price barriers to care are really important, not only in Canada or Britain, but right here in the United States. Now, what do I mean by non-price barrier to care? I mean, how long does it take you on the telephone to get an appointment with a doctor? And then how many days do you have to wait before uh, you can see that doctor? And then how long does it take you to get from your home or office to the doctor's office and back again? And then once you're there, how long do you have to wait before you see the doctor? Those are all non-price barriers to care. Those non-price barriers are going to go up substantially in the next year and a half. Uh, they're already rising. And uh, the truth of the matter is that those non-price barriers are a greater deterrent to health care, even for poor people than the fee that the doctor actually charges. We have in this country about uh, almost 50 million people on food stamps. And people with food stamps can walk into any supermarket that you and I can walk into. They can buy almost any product that we can buy. They say, pay the same price you and I pay. 
they get to the checkout counter and they put the food stamps down and the money on top of it and consummate their transaction. And you never, never hear it said in the United States that low-income people don't have access to supermarkets, right? I mean, the worst that's going to happen is they have to get on a bus and go a distance to get to one. But there's no such thing as a supermarket in the United States who says, we're not taking any new food stamp customers, right? That never happens. Now, over in the healthcare area, there are about 60 million people on Medicaid, and basically they're the same people. And what's the biggest problem that people on Medicaid have? The biggest problem is they can't find a doctor who will see them. I was in Massachusetts um, about a year ago, and uh, I struck up a conversation with a female cab driver. And as I often do when I'm in a different city, I just said, well, how's, how's health care working in Massachusetts? Of course, I knew Governor Romney had his plan in place. And she said, well, uh, I guess it's okay, but I'm having trouble finding a doctor who will see me. And I said, well, tell me about that. And she says, well, I had to go down a list of 20 names before I could find a doctor who would see me. She's on Mass Health, which is Massachusetts Medicaid. And so I said, 20 names. I said, what, are you going down the yellow pages? She said, no, no, I was going down the list that Mass Health gave me. Okay, that's rationing by waiting in, in, in Boston. Um, all over the country, people on Medicaid uh, find it difficult to see doctors uh, 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 without uh, continuous waits. And so what do they do? They go to community health centers. They go to the emergency rooms of, uh, of safety net hospitals. Parkland Hospital in Dallas, they typically won't wait 19 hours. But four, five, six hour wait at Parkland is not unusual. And we're talking about people who often are just seeking basic primary care. You walk in in the morning with a migraine headache and you can wait all day before someone will see you. That's how we're rationing health care in the United States. Same way they ration it in Toronto or London. Um, now, while all this is going on, we have this phenomenon of the walk-in clinics, and I'm sure you must have some here in Lawrence. Uh, in the CVS pharmacy, they're called Minute Clinic, but Walmart has them, and you see them in shopping malls. The name Minute Clinic uh, is implying that they know your time is valuable as well as your money. And so the idea is this is going to be accessible care. It's also high quality care. We have nurses following computerized protocols and for what they do, they follow best practices more closely than the typical primary care physician. So it's high quality, low cost. Here's the problem. In uh, Dallas, Texas, a Medicaid patient who goes to the Minute Clinic with an ear problem or, or a throat problem, um, the charge is about $75, but Medicaid only pays half that amount. And unlike the food stamps over in the healthcare arena, we make it illegal for the patient to take money out of her pocket or his pocket and add it to the Medicaid rate and pay the market price for care. Uh, it's not only illegal, so we make it a matter of criminal law. If the nurse takes money uh, from a Medicaid patient, she could probably be hauled off to, to prison. Um, if we would only allow low-income folks to pay for health care the way they are able to pay for food, we could dramatically increase access to care all over this country uh, for a group of people that uh, are finding access to care very, very, very difficult. Um, and yet this isn't even being contemplated, not even really seriously discussed in the health policy world. This is why Priceless is so different from the normal thing you're going to read. Uh, in, in the book Priceless, we really get outside of the box and say, why aren't we doing this and why aren't we doing Why aren't we doing some obvious things uh, that would seem to make health care more accessible, lower costs, and of higher quality? But the first thing we have to do if we're going to solve some of these problems is free the patient in part in the manner I just described. The second thing we need to do is free the doctor. Doctors are the only professionals in our society that are not free to repackage and reprice their services when demand changes, technology changes, or, or anything in, the, uh, in their environment changes. Uh, the lawyers, the architects, the engineers, uh, uh, the accountants, <laughs> you know, if technology changes, if consumer demand changes, they can change what they're offering to the market. Uh, doctors cannot. They're total slaves to a third-party payer system. The third-party payers tell them what they're going to pay for and what they're not going to pay for, and more or less dictate the prices to them. Just by way of an example, have you ever wondered got my phone again, why the doctor doesn't want to talk to you on the phone about your health condition. You ever wonder that? Now, if I call my doctor friend and I'm inviting him out to dinner and I'm going to pay, well, yeah, I get the call back. 
but it's real hard <laughs> to get uh, a doctor to talk to me about my medical condition on the home, uh, on the phone. And uh, and why is that? Does anybody know? Yes, you're absolutely right. And uh, what do you mean by that? Well, Medicare, you know, doctors are the only professionals, by the way, that are paid by tasks. This is a terrible way to pay a professional. But there are 7,500 tasks that Medicare pays doctors to do. And if the item's on the task list, he gets paid. And if it's not, he doesn't get paid. This isn't on the list, or it's not on the list in any practical way. And, um, and so, <laughs> you don't get to talk to your doctor on the phone. I had a legal problem uh, some time back, and I had a lawyer, and sometimes we met face-to-face, -face, sometimes by phone, sometimes by email. We did whatever seemed to be the most appropriate way to communicate with each other, and she builds by t her time, not by task, and uh, so it's, it, it's seamless, it's smooth. Uh, we, we, we efficiently deal with each other. Uh, I don't efficiently deal with any, any doctor. Now, we get to... Uh, get to the end of the 20th century, and um, everybody discovers email. So everybody's emailing everybody these days. Even the corner liquor store emails me if they have a bottle of wine they know I'm going to like. I don't get uh, an email from my doctor, however. I do get emails from the Minute Clinic. Okay. Remember, the Minute Clinic is outside the, the traditional health care system. And they emailed me in August and said, oh, guess what school's about to start? <laughs> Children need vaccinations before they go to school. And then I got an email from them the other day, and they said, by the way, it's flu season. Yeah, have you got your flu shot yet? I never get an email like that from, from any primary care physician uh, that's, that's paid by Medicare or Blue Cross. Um, and why does the doctor not email me? You, know, you were so good last time. <laughs> this is an easy pop quiz. You just keep repeating that answer, you're going to get an A-plus on this exam. <laughs> exactly. Um, it's not on Medicare's list of 7,500 things uh, it pays for. And Blue Cross pays the same way Medicare pays. All the employer plans, they're all piggybacking on Medicare. So we've got this crazy system. Um, I could talk all day about dumb things uh, that, that, that happen in that system, but I'm going to give you one example that I think is rather remarkable. And it's an example uh, that appeared in The New Yorker. Have any of you heard of Dr. Jeffrey Brenner, Hot Spots? Is that something? No? Okay, he's, uh, he's in Camden, New Jersey. And I'm told that this is the poorest city in the whole country. Uh, everybody in Camden, they're either on Medicare or Medicaid or they're uninsured. It's hardly anybody has private insurance. And Brenner is uh, an entrepreneur. He's a, he's a scientist. He, he, he wants to understand how things work. So he's going through the hospital records, and he discovers that 1% of all the people in Camden are eating up 30% of the hospital's money every year. So he thinks about that, and he starts looking at individual patients, and he picked out one of the worst cases. This is a man who weighed more than 600 pounds. Uh, he's, he's a diabetic. Uh, he's an alcoholic. He's a drug addict. He spends half the year in the hospital, and then the other half the year he's abusing himself. So Brenner takes this guy under his wings, he gets him off alcohol, gets him off drugs, finds out he's a Christian, gets him going to church, gets him going to AA, um, signs him up for some welfare so he can have some financial stability in his life, um, and did a few other things, and lo and behold, the, the guy quits going to the hospital. His health improves, and the costs uh, his, of his medical care are going down, 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 saving tens of thousands of dollars uh, because of this behavioral change. So Brenner and some colleagues got together and set up a little clinic, and they started doing this for, um, uh, for other high-cost patients. Uh, uh, Brenner, in fact, told me that uh, he can drive down the streets of Camden and point to whole buildings and tell you how much the entire building is uh, costing Medicare and Medicaid. Um, so the hot spots are not just patients. They're, they're whole clusters of patients. Now, my question uh, for you is, uh, how much do you think Medicare gives Brenner for all the millions of dollars today that he's saving Medicare? Zero. <laughs> That's a good guess. <laughs> all right. And how much do you think Medicaid gives him for all the millions of dollars he's saving Medicaid? Zero. Okay. And why is that? Because, again, on the list of 7,500 things that these guys pay for, social work just basically isn't there. And what I really described to you a minute ago was basically social work. You, know, you can call it medical care if you like. Um, it's saving medical dollars, medical care dollars. 
but it really is social work. It's getting people to change their lifestyle in a way that changes their health care. Well, at my blog, I said, you know, we need to let uh, Jeffrey Brenner become a millionaire. Uh, we ought to uh, say to Brenner, you know, for every dollar you're saving the system, we're going to give you 20 cents back, put in your pocket. And then we need to tell every other doctor in the country what we've done, and we need to say to all of them, if you can think of a way to get costs down, quality up, uh, well, well, we'll pay you a different way. Uh, we'll, we'll, be able, we'll, we'll do a different deal with you as long as it's sa saving taxpayers money. Uh, on the millionaire part, uh, Brenner called me up and thanked me for that, by the way. Um, but, um, but they're still not giving him the million dollars. This is so opposite of the way anybody in Washington thinks. I first made this proposal to the Bush administration. Uh, Geisinger Hospital System in central Pennsylvania uh, is very innovative and they started offering a warranty for free on heart surgery. So if they screw up and the patient has to be readmitted to the hospital, the buyer doesn't pay again. And um, I remember that was appearing, I think, in the Wall Street Journal about the time I went to Health and Human Services to meet with some of their top guys. And I pulled out the newspaper and said, you ought to get on the telephone and tell these guys that, um, that you're going to pay something for that warranty. And uh, they all shell-shocked. Why would we pay something we don't have to pay for? And I said, because after you do it, then you can send out a message to every hospital in America and say, look, if you think, if you think of a way to save us money, uh, we'll pay you. We'll pay you a different way. You want a warranty? You want some other way of paying you? We'll do it. Because the way we're paying people now is crazy. Um, well, the Bush people thought this was the most radical thing they'd ever heard of. Of course, this is before we got Obamacare, so they had no idea how radical the, the scene was going to get. Um, <laughs> But Republicans are almost as bad as Democrats on this, thinking, you know, that all the rules have to come from Washington. Uh, we, back inside the Beltway, will decide how medicine should be practiced. We don't care what any of you think. And then once we get it down, then we'll tell you what, what to do. Barack Obama has said over and over again what his idea is of health reform. And I think all of you have probably heard it. He says, we're going to go out and find what, out what works, and then we're going to go do it. By which he means, we're going to do the pilot programs, the demonstration projects, and then we're going to find what works and we're going to copy it. This, by the way, is exactly what he says about education. The only difference is that in education, we've been trying to do this for 25 years with no success whatsoever, and we've only been doing it in health care for five or six years with no success whatsoever. The Congressional Budget Office has three times looked at these demonstration projects and three times said they're not working, they're not saving money. And, and why should anybody be surprised? There's no other industry where you have successful innovation that way. Uh, so why would you think it would work in education or in healthcare? We need to liberate the doctors. And the third thing we need to do is liberate the entrepreneurs. Uh, Jeffrey Brenner really is an entrepreneur. The guy who, who um, uh, invented the Minute Clinic concept, he was an entrepreneur. Uh, there's 1,300 such clinics around the country today providing low-cost, accessible, high-quality care to lots and lots of patients. People sometimes ask me, can the free market work in health care? And my response is, the only areas of health care that I think are really working are those areas where the free market has been allowed to allocate resources. And by that I mean uh, they're the areas where the third-party payers are not. So you show me an area of health care where there's no Blue Cross, no Medicare, no employer, and I'll show you a health care market that probably works pretty well. Um, just a quick look around the room. Uh, I would guess that most of you don't know much about the market for cosmetic surgery. But, uh, you know, give it another 10 years and even some of you will begin to get interested in what's happening here. <laughs> this is a market where the third party payers aren't. And um, when you go into this market, you're paying with your own money, out of your own pocket. And what do you see? You see a package price. You can get a package price for anything in healthcare. But for cosmetic surgery, you, the price includes the doctor, nurse, anesthetist facility, one price. You have price competition. You can compare prices. We have in this market had a huge increase in demand, like over the last 15 years, like five, six, 100% increase in procedures. We've had all kinds of technological change of the very type that we're told increases costs everywhere else in the system. And yet in this market, the real price of cosmetic surgery year after year keeps going down, even as the real cost of every other kind of surgery keeps going up. LASIK surgery would be another market where you mainly are just paying out of pocket. Insurers don't pay for LASIK surgery. 
Um, and so what do you have? You have price competition, quality competition, transparency, uh, all the things we say are missing from the rest of the system. And over the last uh, 10 years, the real price of LASIK surgery has gone down by 25%. So um, if markets are allowed uh, to exist, uh, they do work, and they work well in healthcare. There's an international market for medical tourism, and we're getting a domestic market for medical tourism. And if we get a chance, I'll talk about uh, some really fascinating things that, that are happening along those lines. But I want to talk about Obamacare for just a moment, because um, uh, if you're here, you've got to have some interest in what's about to happen to our healthcare system. I think there are six really important problems with Obamacare. And uh, they're so severe that if, if, even if all the Republicans left Washington and the Democrats could do anything they wanted to do, uh, they're going to want to make some, I think, pretty significant changes in the Affordable Care Act. And um, first problem is that you're going to be required to buy a health insurance plan whose cost is going to grow at twice the rate of growth of your income. Now, Barack Obama didn't create this problem. Uh, it's a problem we've been living with for four decades. Uh, and it's not just a U.S. problem, in fact, and we're not the worst country. In fact, we're kind of in the middle of the pack. But, um, but throughout the developed world, basically, healthcare spending per person uh, has been growing at twice the rate of growth of income. And you don't have to be an economist or an accountant or own a pocket calculator to know if something's growing twice, uh, something you're consuming, <laughs> is growing twice as fast as your income, it's going to be crowding out everything else you want to buy. And as a matter of fact, if we continue on the path that we're on, by the time today's college students get out to the retirement age, uh, we will have pushed all the other consumption out the door. And you'll have nothing to eat, nothing to wear, no place to live, but you'll have lots and lots of health care. <laughs> okay. We're not going to get that silly, but, um, but that's the path we're on. Um, again, the president didn't put us on this path, but the legislation locks us in in the sense that uh, you're, you're not going to, a lot of the normal defenses, a lot of the things you would normally do if insurance premiums are going up or some other kind of insurance, you'd go for a higher deductible, maybe more limited coverage, well, you're going to be limited in your ability to do those things. Number two, a bizarre system of subsidies that no one is talking about, at least in the media, being talked about in boardrooms, <laughs> but not in the media. And uh, the healthcare media has been very, very slow on a lot of this stuff. But basically, the hotel down the street um, is employing people that make about $15 an hour. And I don't know if you ever noticed in a hotel who's working there, but, but if you think about it, the maids, uh, the waitresses, the waiters, the, the busboys, the custodial folks, most of the people you see are making about $15 an hour or $30,000 a year if they're working full time. Um, this hotel is going to be required to provide these folks with a health insurance plan that for family coverage costs about $15,000. That's half of what these folks make. So um, I can see it now. The employees come in and the employer says, I've got you know, bad news and good news. The bad news is we're going to cut your wages in half. The good news is you're going to get Obamacare. Um, unless this hotel can figure out a way to get those employees over to the newly created health insurance exchanges. These exchanges are going to be there for people who individually buy their own insurance. And if employees at this wage level can get over into that exchange, the government is going to pay almost all of the premium. Back at the hotel, there is no, nothing, no new subsidy in, in this legislation. Uh, there's a mandate, but no help for the employer and no help for the employee. Over in the exchange, it's a 98% subsidy. So it's thirteen, fourteen thousand dollars subsidy over here versus none over here. So um, at the same time, though, if you have somebody at that hotel, say a manager who's making hundred thousand uh, dollars, he gets no subsidy in the exchange. But when the employer provides the insurance, uh, those premium payments are made with pre-tax dollars, and that means they escape, say, a twenty-five percent federal income tax, fifteen percent payroll FICA tax and I don't know what your income tax rate is here in this state. You do have an income tax, don't you? Is it low? I, you wish it were lower. <laughs> all right, well, you add all that up, and for this higher income guy, the subsidy, the tax subsidy for employer-provided health insurance is equal to almost half the cost of the insurance. So I'm describing to you a world in which above-average wage workers are going to want to continue to get insurance from employers, and below-average 
wage workers, they may not have thought about it, but their employers have, are going to want to be over in this exchange. So how do you get that done? I don't know. Um, uh, Darden's is saying we're going we're to make all these people part-time workers and so we're, we're out from under the mandate. Or maybe you can make them independent contractors. Or maybe you can divide your company into two pieces and, and one company employs below average wage workers and sends them to the exchange, pays a $2,000 fine if it has to, if, if it's really enforced. Um, but 2000 is a lot less than 15, remember. <laughs> And, uh, and, and this other company keeps the higher wage workers. But what, what I'm describing to you is awful from an economist's point of view. We, we don't want companies dissolving and reforming in response to health insurance subsidies. We want these decisions to be made on economic grounds so that we can be efficient and compete in international markets. Um, the third problem with this legislation is the incentives in the exchange. Um, Millions of people are going to go into these exchanges. They're going to purchase insurance in an artificial market. And in this market, the insurers are going to have to charge everybody the same premium regardless of expected health care costs. No matter how sick you are, no matter how well you are, you're all going to pay the same premium. And you don't really have to be in the health insurance business to think about that for very long to realize, okay, uh, these companies are probably going to make a profit on healthy people. And they're probably going to make losses on sick people. And if that's the case, what are they going to do? Well, they're going to try to attract the healthy and avoid the sick, um, just like a lot of them are doing right now under similar uh, constraints. Um, but but the, the, um, um, the perverse incentives don't stop at the point of enrollment, and this is what a lot of people don't understand. Once you've enrolled in a health plan, it's, it's, its incentives, its desire for you or its hostility toward you uh, doesn't change a bit. So if you're healthy, it's going to want to overprovide to you. It's going to want to provide services you didn't even realize you were going to get because it wants to keep you and it wants to attract more people just like you. But if you're a high-cost patient, well, it didn't want you in the first place, and it certainly doesn't want to attract any more just like you, so its incentives will be to underprovide to you. Um, this is not what you want to happen in a healthcare system. Uh, in a sense, every employer in the employer market, every insurance company in the employer market has these same incentives right now. But right now you have protectors and defenders. You have a broker uh, who's, uh, who's your protector. You have an employer who's your protector. Uh, what happens when the brokers go away, which they almost surely will, and what happens when the employ if the employers go away, to go away too? Well, then you're on your own. So you against a system that can be very unfriendly and if you're a high cost patient, it's a system that probably is going to have no interest in spending additional money on you. Uh, we are probably the only group in the whole country that talks about this. Everybody else is ignoring uh, these incentives. But I, uh, I've got a whole chapter in Priceless where I talk about what employers are doing in the face of these incentives, what insurance companies are doing, and what the government is doing. And it's not pretty. And um, right now, just isolated cases of where things are going wrong, but things are going to go wrong in a big way if we push millions of people into a system where everybody's incentives are perverse. Now, fourth problem is over on the buyer side of the market. Um, we just had a Supreme Court case over the mandate, and uh, arguments went back and forth, and people felt real strongly on one side and the other, but the truth of the matter is, this is a very weak mandate. I mean, we're only talking about, you know, a few hundred dollars uh, fine versus thousands of dollars of health insurance costs. So the, so the fine itself is small compared to what we're trying to get people to do. And uh, it, it, it necessarily will be weakly enforced because the IRS is not going to be able to attach your wages or, or, or attach your assets in order to, to, to collect that fine. About the only thing it can do is withhold a refund. So its, its inherent powers to do something are weak. And then the IRS, on top of all that, announced the other day they don't really plan to do much to enforce this anyway. So if you have a mandate that nobody's enforcing, what kind of incentives does that leave you with? Your, your incentive is to stay uninsured while you're healthy. Why, why pay premiums? Uh, uh, why pay $15,000 to an insurance company if you're healthy? But after, if you get a problem, then you sign up uh, for the, and pay the same premium healthy people pay. 
and, um, and then you get your care and your bills paid, and then you drop coverage after all of that. In Massachusetts, these are called jumpers and dumpers. You know, people jump in, they, and they dump the plan when, uh, after the bills are paid. Well, look, if we all do that, um, only sick people are going to have health insurance. If only sick people are paying premiums, those are going to be really, really high premiums. Uh, that's a way to kill the system. Fifth problem is, um, I think of it as a safety net problem, and, but, but basically the origin of it is, is this, this act just way over promises. Okay? Uh, we have promised benefits to people that we're not going to pay for, <laughs> or we don't have a way to pay for. Uh, there will be about 30 million new, newly insured in about a year and a half, those are the projections, and if the economic studies are correct, uh, these people will try to double their consumption of health care. So once they're insured, they'll try to consume twice as much health care as when they weren't insured. And uh, on top of that, all the rest of you are going to have more generous insurance than you otherwise would have wanted, and many of you may already have experienced it. And there's a whole long list of preventive services that you're going to get with no deductible, no copayment. And when you have those benefits, you're going to be tempted to take advantage of them. Um, and so what I'm talking about is a huge increase in demand, no change in supply, there's nothing in this act that creates one new doctor, just like Massachusetts. Same thing over there. I was testifying a few months back, and it was the Democrats that I think were astounded when I said this to them. I said, yeah, yes, we've cut the number of uninsured in half in Massachusetts, and that was a very commendable thing to do. But so far as I can tell, no one's getting any, any more care in Massachusetts. There are no new doctors, no new nurses, no new clinics. We have just as many people going to hospital emergency room as we did before, just as many people going to the community health centers. Basically, everybody's going to get care where they went before. All we're doing is just moving money around. And um, that was something they never heard before. But that's what's happening there. And uh, nationwide, what's going to happen is those non-price barriers to care are going to rise. The wait to see a doctor, the wait to get a procedure is going to go longer and longer because demand exceeds supply. And what happens in a market like that? In a market like that, you don't want to be in a plan that pays less than all the other plans are paying, right? Because from the doctor's point of view, if, if the fee you're going to bring him is less than the fee he's going to bring me, uh, then I want to see him first and you second. And so those folks will be pushed to the end of the waiting lines. Now, who is it that's in plans that pay less than what others pay? They are the disabled and the elderly in Medicare, poor people in Medicaid, and if Massachusetts example is followed, newly insured people in subsidized plans in the exchange. Who are these people? These are the most vulnerable people in our society. And I'll bet anything that most Democrats in Congress who voted for the Affordable Care Act thought they were going to help all those folks. But the reality is that access to care may actually go down. And access is going to get even more difficult for another reason. It's Anybody that can afford it is going to seek a different way, a different system. The concierge, how many of you have a concierge doctor? How many of you know what a concierge doctor is? Okay, all right. A lot more you're going to know <laughs> very soon. Uh, basically, I'm going to tell you. Basically, a concierge doctor, the, the standard model, the most common model, is the doctor says, okay, um, I'm for $1,500 to $2,000 a year. Okay, you're going to have same day service or next day service. I'm going to talk to you by phone. I'm going to talk to you by email. I'm going to be your advocate in the system. You need a test. I'm going to help you get it. You need an appointment with a specialist. I'm going to help you get that too. Um, he's your advocate. Uh, basically, a concierge doctor is practicing medicine the way most doctors hoped they would be able to practice medicine when they first went to medical school. But here's the problem with that. Uh, the normal primary care doctor is seeing about 2,500 patients. But when he becomes a concierge doctor, he, he, he only takes about 500 of those patients with him. Because basically, you can't handle more than five or 600 patients practicing medicine that way. But we just left 2,000 behind. And now they've got a big problem. So the more doctors that become concierge doctors, the worse it gets for anybody who can't afford to have one. And that's coming. Um, final problem is for the elderly. Uh, it's really true that I don't know why uh, I don't know why the news media allows this debate to go on because there's no question about how Obamacare is paid for. A good chunk of it is paid for by reducing 
money spent on Medicare. And over the next 10 years, it's about $716 billion. Um, where's that money going to come from? Well, to hear the president, the vice president talk about it, they've found savings. But nobody can, can tell us what those savings are because they haven't found any savings. And what the chief actuary of Medicare says is that uh, he doesn't even take any of that seriously. He just says the law is going to require reductions in fees to doctors and hospitals. Uh, for hospitals, uh, basically, they're not gonna, the Medicare is going to pay about what Medicaid pays going on forever, not just 10 years, it goes on forever. And on the doctors, in just another year or so, Medicare fee drops below Medicaid and just keeps on getting further and further behind Medicaid. Basically, seniors are going to be less desirable than welfare mothers from the point of view of doctors. And, uh, um, we're looking at the prospect of them having all the problems that Medicaid folks have today, having to go to community health centers, having to go to hospital emergency rooms, and finding it very difficult to find a routine doctor who will take care of them. Those are the six biggest problems. I think they're so big that, um, that they can't be left alone. They can't be ignored. And so Congress is going to have to come back and do something. Uh, everybody inside the Beltway thinks the cuts in Medicare will actually never happen, that when seniors find they can't find doctors, they'll be on the phone, you'll be calling your doctor, you'll be calling your senator, right? You'll be saying, why, why is this happening to me? And the pressure will be so intense that Congress will say, oh, okay, <laughs> we can't do this, we're gonna restore the spending to make it back like it was. But of course, if they do that, that means we never paid for the Affordable Care Act. And it means we've created a new entitlement with no way to pay for it, and we're just adding to the deficit uh, forever. Now, real quickly on on what I would like to see us do, um, which is more radical and more progressive than what Obamacare does. Um, and um, actually, it, it comes very close to a plan that, that John McCain ran on in the, in the last time he ran for president against Barack Obama. Uh, and and pro I doubt if most of you even remember what his health care plan was. But uh, basically, what we recommend is that we take all of the subsidies, tax and spending subsidies, now in the system, all the ways in which we're encouraging people to, to, to have private health insurance, take all that money, divide it up, <laughs> give everybody a refundable tax credit, same amount of money for everybody who's going to buy private health insurance, and I believe we could afford $2,500 for an adult, $8,000 for a family. And the way this works is it's a refundable tax credit. If you don't owe any income taxes, if you get private health insurance, you, the first $8,000 is basically paid with a tax refund. It's paid for by the government. And everything above that is paid by you and your employer with after-tax dollars. So the typical employer plan in the United States today for a family costs about sixteen thousand. Well, your subsidy is eight. So, so, the, so we're going to subsidize the core insurance we want everybody to have, and then all those extras—that's that's with after-tax dollars. Those are dollars that you could go spend on something else. This would cause a radical change in uh, our system, uh, just very quickly because uh, all of us would then have to ask, well, well, what are we getting for the second eight? I mean, do, do we really want acupuncture? Do we want in vitro fertilization? Do we want natural path therapy? I mean, how, much, how much is it worth to all of us to pay for this through an insurance company? I mean, or would it be better if we kept the money and if we really want those things, we'll just pay for them on our own uh, uh, instead of um, laundering the money uh, through Aetna or United Health? All right, so the first thing is we, we get a rational way of subsidizing health insurance. And second thing is we acknowledge going in that there will be, be people who turn down this offer. Okay, there will be people who just choose to be uninsured. So then what are we going to do? Well, here is something McCain didn't do but should have endorsed. Unclaimed tax credits need to go to safety net institutions in the area where the uninsured person lives. Uh, money should follow people. So if everybody in Lawrence wants to be in a private plan, okay, our subsidy dollars go over here. We don't give any money to safety net institutions in Lawrence. <laughs> if everybody here decides, oh no, we don't want to be insured, then all of that money goes to safety net institutions. What I mean by safety net institutions is if you go in the hospital and you get care and you can't pay the bill, there's money there. We're not going to leave you out on the street. Um, all right, the third thing we need to do is we need generous health savings accounts for everyone, including especially the chronically ill. Uh, right now, the accounts are too restrictive. They really are designed mainly with healthy people in mind, but it's the diabetic, the asthmatic, the other chronic patients. 
evidence shows that uh, they can manage their own care better, with better results than traditional care. But if they're going to manage the care, they need to manage the money that pays for that care. And then uh, uh, fourth, um, we need portable insurance. If we had portable insurance, we would never have the problem of pre-existing conditions. But do you know in this state it's illegal for your employer to buy insurance for you that you own and take with you to the next job and in and out of the labor market? We've made that illegal in Texas and Kansas and everywhere all over the country. What were they thinking? <laughs> we need to do the opposite. We need to encourage employers to buy. You know, if you're going to deal with Blue Cross, buy the Blue Cross individual, not the Blue Cross group. Group is what you lose when you change jobs. Individual is what you take with you when you change jobs. And finally, um, this is mentioned in my article tomorrow in the Wall Street Journal, um, we need real insurance. And real insurance is insurance against getting a pre-existing condition. So when I buy life insurance, um, then I get my prostate cancer results back and they're bad for me. Um, I don't get kicked out of the pool. You know, my premium doesn't go up. Uh, and if the cancer kills me, the, my family gets the money, right? And health insurance should work the same way. If you get a change in your health condition and you have to switch to another health plan, then your old insurer ought to pay the additional premium that you're going to be charged because your condition has worsened. So you leave the market free to price risk. Give the insurance folks and the health plans an incentive to actually attract sick people and solve their problems instead of running away from them but you protect the individual because you allow them access to insurance pro product that's going to uh, protect them. Um, I'm going to wrap up and let you all have at me. I think if you say as many controversial things as I just said, you certainly have to give people an opportunity <laughs> to tell, you, tell me what's on your mind. Um, but let me just conclude by saying uh, I was introduced as the father of health savings accounts. Uh, I believe that the most important thing about the health savings account is the issue of power, that, that, that we're dealing with a system that can be very, very bureaucratic. Uh, it, it looks in some ways not much different from the Department of Motor Vehicles. And I believe that uh, if you control the money, you control the power, this system is going to work better for you than if you cede that money and that power to an impersonal bureaucracy. Thank you all for listening to me. Okay, this young lady wants you to speak into the microphone if you have a question. Hi. Um, I'm a social worker, okay. and uh, I agree with consumer-driven, but I just want to challenge you on the example of the hotel worker at 15000 It's not correct. The subsidy in the exchange is, uh, first of all, Medicaid is very low eligibility, low poverty rate, and so the people in the upper or more middle-class area can participate in the exchange at the uh, proportional rate, not 98%. 98% subsidy comes from the federal government to the state Medicaid program or the state health exchange. But my question is, how can entrepreneurial approach uh, make money on the uninsured? How is this a moral process? Well, um, let, me, let me go back to the exchange just real quickly. Um, basically, at 138% of poverty, uh, people can go into the health insurance exchange. Below that, they go into Medicaid, unless the state doesn't expand the Medicaid, in which case it goes all the way down to 100% to of poverty. Um, but in any event, at an income level of about um, thirty dollars to $33,000 in that range for a family, um, basically the family only has to pay 2% of its income for health insurance. And, um, and the and government, federal government is going to subsidize the rest of it. Now, as the income goes up, this, the subsidy goes down. Once you get up to 80000 or so, it goes away entirely. Uh, but for, the, for, for, for basically low-income workers, um, this is very generous, hugely generous, Com especially compared to the fact that... They didn't that have access because they didn't have access before because they couldn't, they didn't have companies to pay for it. So it, it really helps people who wouldn't have access to it, as well as those that are middle income and don't um, either work for a company or... Well, they'll have... They'll have health insurance. And if this insurance pays Blue Cross rates, they'll have access. But if it pays Medicaid rates, their access may not be very good. Now, on the uninsured, you got to remember that what Jeffrey Brenner was doing in Camden, a lot of the people he helps are uninsured, but he's saving money for the system. 
And so, so he's an entrepreneur, and, and um, that's a, you don't have to, he, he, he doesn't think of himself like a Steve Jobs or, or Bill Gates, but he really is. I mean, he's, he's doing creative things and, and creating lots of value. And um, I had a really nice conversation with him. I, I, w I want to liberate folks like him all over the country. That, that is social work. And I think creative social work can save money for the system. Uh, let, let, let's get this one question in here real quick. She said, how does Brenner make money? Brenner is, <laughs> doesn't have any money. He goes around and begs private charities <laughs> to, to fund his, his enterprise. And, and sadly, he's trying to become an affordable care organization, which is uh, the new uh, Obamacare type HMO. I was really sorry when I heard that because um, he now will try to fit into their system when what we need to do is fit our system to his. Coming uh, to Kansas, your comment about the hotel and the exchange, subsidies are available under the individual market, correct? Not under the small business. If that hotel decided that they wanted to provide insurance for their employees, they pay for the insurance policy that is chosen. But it's, or, um, am I correct in thinking that the subsidies are only for the individuals who go out on their own to purchase insurance, not for the employers who provide the insurance under the shop exchange? Is that That's accurate? Right. That's right. We have two different ways of subsidizing care here. One is the traditional way that's in the law right now that says the employer can pay with pre-tax dollars. For a high-income employee, that's worth almost half the cost of the insurance. But for an employee that's only earning uh, $30,000 a year, that employee probably is paying no income tax at all. So the only taxes you're avoiding are the 15% FICA tax. So that's worth $2,000, a little over $2,000. So that's the subsidy in the current law versus $13,500 subsidy over in the exchange. For the high income worker, zero here, uh, $7,500 or so over at the place of employment. Those are radically different numbers. And no one's talking about this. No one. By no one, I mean nobody in the healthcare press. Employers are thinking about it a lot. Darden's is thinking about it, but, no, but nobody's writing about it. Well, it sounds like you're still talking about a health care system that relies heavily on being um, funded by government or some other Medicaid. Where, I don't understand the, uh, where you're going with this. You get a health savings account, you get how much money? Oh, uh, my, my example was $2,500 for adult and $8,000 for a family of four. To spend? On private health insurance and deposits to health savings accounts. But if they can't afford that? Well, no, they, they get that. That, that's, that's a gift from Uncle Sam. From, okay, so it's, it's not a free market then. It's not an open market. It's not bartering with your doctor on a dollar-to-dollar -dollar basis. It's still subsidized government it, health care. It, it is not getting government out of the system. It is not a separation of, of state and health care. I, I, I concede that. Um, and you just don't have anything after that as far as insurance goes for major medical... No, no, this is major medical. This is going to pay for catastrophic coverage, core insurance that, that, that we want everybody to have, but it's not going to pay for the whole $16,000 array of benefits that employers are now giving their employees. So if you want that second eight, then you have to have less wages to pay for it. Okay. How much do Brenner's services cost, and would that be a part of your plan that people would also have a uh, social worker who would help them through the system? Well, uh, Brenner doesn't charge anything to his patients. Right, I understand. Okay. What I want to do is let Brenner, if Brenner's making millions of dollars for, for us as taxpayers, I want to let Brenner make a lot of money for himself. That's the key. And how I want to liberate this I want to liberate the system. So he is the example of the provider system that you would create? I want to go all over the country and wherever we find people who are saving money for the system, I want to start writing them checks right now. So you're saving taxpayers money, we're going to reward you. Then I want to tell everybody else, see basically what happens in this system is that doctors 
All providers, everybody on the provider side, gets up every morning. What do they think about? How can I get more money out of these reimbursement formulas? That's what they're totally focused on. So now what I'm saying is let's change their focus. Let's say you can think creatively about how you want to be paid, how you're going to provide care to your patients. And we will pay you in a different way if you save money for us and you improve the quality of care. So Geisinger Hospital is an example. Brenner is an example. Well, there's lots of examples. So is that then the concierge method? No. No, but if a concierge doctor wants to make, you know, a proposal to be paid a different way, we should consider that too. In other words, I want the new ideas to come from the people who are the best people to produce those new ideas, not a bunch of bureaucrats back in Washington. Well, now on the savings account, um, I'm a single individual. I get $2,500, and then I can save whatever money I want separately. Mm -hmm. In, in, a, in a Roth health savings account. But $2,500 isn't going to buy me much health care. Well, uh, it, uh, the average Obamacare for, uh, premium for an individual is about $4,500. So this pays $2,500 of that amount. And the rest comes out of your pocket. Um, and I can see that, like, I don't spend that much. Well, yeah, I do if I have to have some physical therapy for my bad hip, um, that I would spend that much, and then everything else comes out of my pocket. And what if I have, you know, a medical emergency, and, um, you know, I do have a savings, but it just might not cover the entire cost. But you don't get the tax credit unless you have catastrophic insurance. In other words, this, you, don't, you don't get the credit. You, this isn't cash for you. This is money mainly going to insurance plan, insurance companies, health plans. So if you have an emergency, it pays the cost of the emergency. Um, I was wondering why you haven't explained in the Affordable Care Act lots of other features, uh, but one of them in particular, because I do believe prevention matters. And in the Affordable Care Act, it's my understanding, and it's already happening, that if you go in for your wellness exam, you can get a colonoscopy, you can get flu shots, you can get screening, you can get a whole list of services that are wellness uh, directed. And I think they've learned that. Insurance companies already institute that now, and they believe it's a good incentive. And so you wonder what I think about all that. Well, <laughs> why you didn't mention it. Because oh, it, oh. Is, it is all right in line. Because I only had the, so much time, and so okay. I, <laughs> but, but I'll, I'll talk about prevention a little bit. Um, I think prevention's a good thing, and, and I, I do preventive things, uh, okay? But, uh, but I'm not under the, some illusion that I'm saving myself money, because I'm not. Uh, I'm, I, I spend money on preventive health. Um, very few preventive procedures pay for themselves in the sense of lowering total costs for the system. Um, Smoking cessation device pays for itself. Uh, prenatal care for at-risk mothers pays for itself. Uh, immunizations for children pay for themselves. Almost nothing else pays for itself. Mammograms, pap smears, PSA tests, uh, colonoscopies, none of that pays for itself. And by that I mean that if you screen 10,000 people, uh, uh, 9,998 of them are healthy, and you, you spent all that money doing those screenings on healthy people, because you found two people that have a problem, and you save money for the two people, but that's overwhelmed by the money you spend on all the, all the healthy people. So, so we ought to encourage people uh, to get preventive medicine, but they ought to do it with their own dollars, and they ought to think about you know, what's worth it to them, and only make something free if it really does pay for itself. That's my philosophy of insurance. Kind of just a little surprised you've gotten through this whole thing without mentioning the patient-centered medical home, um, which espouses a lot of these things. I, I'm a family practice doctor. We're involved with something through Blue Cross Blue Shield in Kansas City about this. I, I have mixed feelings about it. I, I think some of it makes sense. Some of it doesn't make sense. Some of it puts a big onus on the office that up front is cost heavy. <laughs> But as you say, if they pay us in a different fashion and we can reduce costs by getting better outcomes, 
it makes sense. Things like if a person refills their medication on time, <laughs> they get it for free. <laughs> it incentivizes them to refill their medication on time. <laughs> if they get their hemoglobin A1C, they get their cholesterol checked at the appropriate times, which presumably is gonna allow us to better control them, that makes sense. But like I said, it's a huge upfront impact on the office until we start getting paid for that down the line by the insurance company. Um, I think the concept of the medical home is really interesting. Uh, I can point you to the, some examples where I think it's saving money. Um, I don't have a lot of confidence in Blue Cross doing it. I don't have a lot of confidence in the federal government doing it. Um, the examples that I know of that seem to be working well, at IntegraNet down in Houston, uh, contracts with Medicare Advantage plans, and it's doing a lot of innovative things, but they're not following some rule book. They're, they're experimenting in the market, finding out what works and what, what, what doesn't work. They pay their doctors three times what Medicare ordinarily pays. And in return for that extra payment, they get the doctors to do things they want uh, done. And so, so the doctors are winning, and they're keeping total costs down, and it's impressive, but this is not an insurance company. I don't think uh, Blue Cross can do this. I don't think Aetna can do it or United Health. I think it's doctors. This is an independent doctors uh, association. Um, they go by different names around the country. Maybe you have some here. Maybe, maybe this is what you're doing yourself. But, um, but it's, it, it's the doctors that make it work, not the insurance company. No, you know, I, employ a lot more people to track down lab results, to track down clinical results, and that's just, that's a lot of overhead. Granted. You better track your patients. But IntegraNet of Houston is an independent practice association. It's, doc, it's a doctor organized entity, not an insurance entity. And that's why I think it works as well as it does. Um, okay, so the, the Brenner as a prototype for like neo-rugged individualism in America to give people incentives if they lower the healthcare cost. Is this a problem to try to influence the American people to take it upon themselves to help others? And like you're really throwing the emphasis upon the individual helping the other individuals as opposed to, is this, is this a problem? Do you see it, do you foresee a problem with that? It seems really difficult or, or problematic. It's kind of a more, it's not really a healthcare question, but I mean, do you understand the question? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's a huge problem. <laughs> you know, what, so what do we want to do? We want to meet people's needs. We want to solve their problems. Okay. And we have one system that has a schedule of things that you, if you do things that are on their list, they pay you so much money. And so we've got the whole doctor community looking at the list and doing only things that are billable and not doing things that are not billable. Uh, and that's understandable because that's their economic incentive. And so I'm saying, well, why don't we turn that around? Why don't we say to every doctor, if you can think of a better way to meet people's needs, we'll pay you differently. You tell us how you want to be paid. As long as we're, we're saving money and the patient's gaining, we'll do it. That ought to be the philosophy for dealing with providers. Who exactly is the we that you gave in that last sentence? I mean, we the government. Medicare. Okay, then let's throw in a couple other um, entities. I mean, I, you know, I agree to work with the idea of the incentives, but the other institutions that seem to be playing, that seem to be affecting things tremendously here, in addition to doctors per se, we're dealing with big pharma. We're dealing with um, attorneys. How do those, I mean, I mean we're, we're dealing with the push and shove here. So we have insurance, we have big pharma, we have attorneys, uh, and we have the medical profession per se. So how do those can in fact we, <laughs> Put the pressure there, or in, or in fact, will these individual institutions push back, yeah. like they right. seem to be doing right now? Right. Well, just one more word about the we. Um, um, 
Blue Cross on its own could start paying people in a radically different way. And so could United Health and Aetna and, and the private insurers. But they're each one of them a small part of the market. Medicare is a big part of the market. And so I think Medicare, if, if Medicare jump started it, all the, all the others would be doing the same. They tend to follow Medicare. Um, and interestingly enough, most people think Medicare is run by the government. Actually, it's run by Blue Cross and other private insurers. Um, now, as for the other entities, uh, yes, I, 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 I fear them. Uh, they, they gave us the, the Affordable Care Act. They got in the room and they went around the table and said, okay, what do you guys want? What do you guys, what do you want? And once they got from going around the table, that we got this Rube Goldberg contraption that we call the Affordable Care Act. Um, I am focused on public policy. I want good policy. And then good policy gives all those other folks incentives to do the right thing instead of the wrong thing. The priceless is about good policy. Well, thank you all very much. Right?